Okay. Um, yay, for you and for the camera. All right. So on last Tuesday, uh, Rüdiger ended with Altair and wanted to show you Voyager, or rather Voyager 2, uh, for a second. So let me do that now. Voyager is a nice user interface um, that relies on this Vega Light language, which uh, Rüdiger also explained already a bit last Tuesday. And what the so what Voyager is made for, it's for data exploration, but it's for um, breadth-first exploration as well as, so at first showing like univariate summaries, like f the first look at your data, where you just want to explore what your data set look, looks like. And then also um, after you gain the overview, like for answering specific questions, which you gain by looking at this Voyager. So it's a mixed initiative system, blending manual and automated chart specification. So you start with the open-ended exploration and then it also supports targeted question answering, like you see something, yay, we too. You see something um, in your breadth first um, exploration and then you want to dig into that and Voyager allows that. Um, there is a Jupyter Lab extension um, that allows uh, to use Voyager directly from, in, from within Jupyter. Um, however, so that's why I'm um, saving this cast data set here. Um, however, this is broken um, pretty much. I don't know what the issue exactly is and why nobody else has like, um, like there, are, there is an issue on GitHub, there are no issues on GitHub about that. I don't know, we have some kind of error so we don't use the Jupyter Lab extension. I hope it's going to be back like next year or something, but um, it also has this Voyager um, page on github.io, which I'm going to use now to show you. Um, so what do we see here? We see a lot. Um, so first of all, imagine at the start, I didn't have a data set selected. So this here is my entire panel. At first, I'm going to start by selecting the data set, which is this little part here. So we select data, and then we can change our data set. In this um, demo on github.io, there are a few standard known data sets uh, already given like the Iris data set, like one of the most common introduction to machine learning uh, data sets, and also the CAS data set, which we already used a couple of times and which we're going to use now. Uh, even You can even upload data or uh, get data from Pacific URL as JSON or CSV. Um, with this demo, and again, you can just use Voyager, the uh, Voyager in Jupyter Lab, as soon as it works correctly again. So the advantage on the Jupyter Lab version is that you can export your code to um, something that Altair, for example, can already show you, which is really nice. We cannot really do that in um, the web view, um, but we can ex at least export this Vega Lite code. Okay, so now we selected a data set. So we have here, we selected a data set. Now once we have something, um, Data Voyager is going to show us all the columns of our data set. So we see that these cylinders, name, origin, year, acceleration, and so on and so on, correspond to the columns of our data set here, from our cast data set. Um, it also tells us if it's um, a categorical variable, which is the A here, a temporal field, which is the calendar icon here, and a quantitative field, field which are numbers, which are all the others. Um, and now I can simply, so I see when I have nothing selected, this is the breadth first approach of this data Voyager. It's going to show me already all the univariate summaries. So because I didn't select anything, this field with the selected view, it's this field right here, is empty because well, I didn't select anything. Um, but as soon as I open a data set, um, it's going to show me, for example, all the univariate summaries for all um, fields my uh, data set has. So, we can already look at this. So we load the data set and we can already familiarize ourselves with the data set. What do we see here? So um, we see, for example, here in the uh, count univariate summaries that most cars seem to have an even numbers of cylinders. There are almost no cars with three or five cylinders and none with seven. Um, we see that there are multiple times um, the same car in there. So for example, this AMC Matador. Meter is there five times, but most of the cars are there only once. Um, as we see here, 
We see that most cars are from the, from the US. We see that the cars are all between 1970 and 1982. Um, we see that the acceleration seems to be somehow um, roughly three, yes. Um, what we normally distributed, whereas all the others are, well, that's definitely not a normal distribution, uh, and so on and so on. So we see already, we have the univariate summaries, we can already see something. And if something interests us, that's what I did here, that's why there's a comment field here, I can click this icon already and I can bookmark it and make a nice note, cars more than once, I don't know. And then I can, for example, go to my bookmark here, I'm gonna do that later. Um, to look at this very um, chart again, uh, if I found it interesting. Okay, so this is what we see already. Yes. Um, how do you make the connection between your uh, This doesn't have a connection right now. Like I said, so this is like a demo only. This GitHub uh, on uh, accessible on uh, viga.github.io. And <laughs> um, there is a Jupyter Lab extension. So. Um, so this extension here exists, um, but the problem is that all the windows, um, like the like, it has a context menu with everything like that actually combines this web view of Voyager with Jupyter Lab, and they're all blank and all buttons are blank. And I don't know that's an issue right now. Build failing. That's that doesn't look good. So it is broken right now. Um, I couldn't, um, couldn't install an older version uh, at, as of now, but it doesn't change too much because I'm just gonna look at the demo anyway and at the demo features anyway. The only thing which we won't see here is that we can export it to a Vega Lite code, which we can use in Python. Um, we can also, also, we can export to a Vega Lite code, so let me do that right now. So you saw I bookmarked this um, univariate summary for the count. If I go to bookmarks now, I can go here now. Uh, I see that it's here in my bookmark also bookmark something else, and I can export this Vega Lite code. If I had the Jupyter Lab extension, I could also export it as um, Altair uh, graph. That would just be another button, export as, and then something more useful. But this button is blank, and I can't show you anyway, so I'm just gonna show you this web view. Okay. So, but after looking, so these are all the uh, univariate summaries. Wow, there's so many people here. So after looking at all these univariate summaries, um, we want to look at, for example, potential associations. So these are univariates. We don't want only univariates. We want, uh, we want to see some associations. And we see, so these are all the fields which are in this data set, and these are wildcards, which means take any categorical field. So if we drag this somewhere, for example, on the x-axis here, um, it's gonna make, normally it should, to make it to, let's put it to be any. So now it's gonna compare, why isn't it? Because we're not looking at quantitative field, that doesn't make much sense, does it? So, oh yeah, like this is obviously only shows univariate. So we can, so we have different kinds of encoding here. Rudiger told you this already last week. So we can obviously have stuff on the x and on the y axis. If we only have something on the x axis, so for example, we could, drop, we could look at any quantitative field on the x axis. So if we have this white card here, it's just gonna put every like acceleration, displacement, horsepower, mass per gallon, weight, because those are all the quantitative, field, quantitative fields on the x axis, which is what we're seeing here now. So we could also drag the acceleration only on the x-axis and then we would see only one graph in our specified view and we'll get to the other fields later. Um, and we see that this is now, well, again, it's univariate. We only see this one here, okay? Uh, we can drop this to the x and to the y-axis. We could also make column and rows, which is what Rudiger showed you on uh, Tuesday also. Then we have like multiple rows depending on like where we have one chart for, I don't know, three cylinders, one chart for four cylinders and so on and so on. Um, later on, as soon as we added stuff here, we could also encode stuff as the shape or as the color, also uh, like Rüdiger showed you on Tuesday. So here, size, color, shape, detail, and text. We could also drop stuff to the any. So if we want to look at the combination of all quantitative, 
like of all quantitative fields with all others, like acceleration with displacement and acceleration with horsepower and acceleration with miles per gallon and displacement with horsepower, displacement with miles per gallon and so on and so on. What we're simply going to do is we're going to drop these quantitative fields to any both and then um, Voyager is going to see what looks best and it's going to su suggest me these looks, um, these views here. So we direct two quantitative wildcard fields to the any shelves and now we see each pair of quantitative fields um, to make a gallery of scatter plots. So we see acceleration against displacement, acceleration against horsepower and so on and so on. So what do we see here, for example? We see, for example, a Wathri quadratic relationship between horsepower and miles per gallon. Um, so where's horsepower miles per gallon here? That looks Wathri quadratic, I'd say. Okay, so this chart here is the same as, as if I would directly had horsepower on the x-axis and miles per gallon on the y-axis. Okay, so dragging horsepower here and miles per gallon here would show me this same plot as the specified view. Um, but yeah, just to show you here. So, but assume we didn't do that, um, but we saw it here. So that looks interesting because, like I said, looks roughly quadratic. Let's bookmark it and see um, roughly quadratic. So this is only by inspecting the um, plot. Uh, once we did that, we would actually look at if it's actually a statistically relevant quadratic relationship, right? Okay, um, but now let's look, uh, let's look at this in detail, which, for which we have the specify button. And we see here already when I hover over the button, I see what uh, that would look like. So this would look like horsepower against miles per gallon. So if I click it, it does the very same thing as I just did. Uh, as this very same thing as dragging horsepower here and miles per gallon here. And we see in our specified view this very chart, even with our comment which we just make, made. So what's really nice and interesting about Data Voyager is that it always shows related views if I have this one specified view. So uh, Data Voyager shows me other plots which may also look interesting for me, which may be a better representation of the data here as my related view. So we see this here is basically a two-dimensional histogram. You still see the quadratic relationship, um, but both are binned. Yeah, if I hover over it, that's, that's what it would look like. So I would have, so that's what a two-dimensional histogram is made of. So we have the horsepower here, but we're going to bin it. We have the miles per gallon here, but also bin. So there's just a function after whatever the values here are. And as marks, uh, the, the, so we have the count of how many um, items fall into this bin represented as the size, which makes this two-dimensional um, histogram. The other thing, the other related view which uh, it suggests me is have a binning the horsepower and taking the mean of each bin of the miles per gallon per horsepower. So what I see here is an obvious relationship that where the lower the horsepower, um, the higher, so in each category basically, the higher the miles per gallon uh, on average that a car has, which is what I would expect from a car, right? So more horsepower means um, higher uh, well, less miles per gallon. Okay, um, so these related views show variants uh, of that of that graph here, like related ones. Um, good. So, what it also shows is uh, the next thing is like add category field. So it suggests me that I could add another category field, and this here is simply. Um, if I hover over it, it would have the same plot here, horsepower against miles per gallon, uh, but as color, I, it wants to use the cylinders. And if we had this plot, we would see that, aha, uh -huh, uh, apparently the cars with more cylinders have, well, more horsepower, but less miles per gallon, and the lower the cylinders are, um, the higher the miles per gallon rate, but the less horsepower it has. It also suggests me that I could um, color it via the origin, and doing this, we see that well, all the high horsepower cars seem to come from the USA, and all the low horsepower cars seem to come from Japan. So um, let's look at this plot, the same, just with the color equals origin. What we could also then do, for example, is we could um, filter 
by origin, such that we see here now if we deselect the USA, we see that even if there's no USA in there, uh, that where Japan has more efficient cars but less strong cars than Europe on average. Speaking of average, haha. -ha, um, so when I have this chart here now, my uh, related views will show me the averages, right? So it, another view I might be interesting according to Voyager is horsepower against miles per gallon, but taking the mean of both. And we see here that Japanese cars are more efficient than Europe cars in the mean, but only a teeny tiny bit, uh, have only a teeny tiny bit less horsepowers. Uh, let's take the USA into this field again, and we see that where um, US cars have definitely, uh, are definitely less efficient, but have definitely higher horsepower. So this, is, this may also be an interesting plot. Um, so let's bookmark it too. Um, let's do it like this. So we confirm the mean horsepower of US cars is higher and the mean miles per gallon is lower. Okay, so if we uh, hover here again, we see what, yeah, okay, I mean, this is exactly what we have here, um, besides that we want to take the mean and to get this plot here. Okay, um, now there's one thing uh, left we're wondering, and that is how origin, so where the car is coming from, affects other statistics besides the miles per gallon horsepower. So let's, after we bookmarked all our interesting, all, all the plots we're interested in, um, let's clear our encodings to well, show us the start page again with univariate summaries. And um, let's look at, let's put origin on the y-axis, origin on the y-axis, and uh, blah, 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 a quantitative wildcard on the x-axis, which compares now origin to all other um, numeric variables. And what we can also do is, so we saw already sometimes that it showed the mean as interesting plots. We can, of course, select that too. So we can have a no function mean, mean, median, sum, binning, which is what we also saw already mean and max. Um, let's have a wildcard here such that we can, for example, look at the mean and at well, no function but taking all the variable points. And now we see here for, so what we're comparing it now is all quantitative data against origin, taking the mean or of the origin or not taking the mean of the origin. So we see here, for example, and on of the origin but of the um, quantitative field. So we see here, this is a distribution of acceleration by origin, and this is, um, well, the mean of that, so this is basically a bar chart of that same thing. So what do we see here? Well, obviously there are more US cars, and there are a few Europe cars which have uh, a higher acceleration than US cars. Maybe it's a worse acceleration, a worse acceleration than the US cars. And also when looking at the bar plot, we see that on average, US cars have the best ac acceleration, but where they're also the ones with the highest horsepower, so not too much information. So we see that US cars have a much higher standard deviation of displacement, but the mean of displacement is much higher for US cars. Again, that obviously correlates with the uh, horsepower as well. So horsepower against origin, we saw that the mean horsepower of US cars is much higher, but the mean miles per gallon is much lower, and the weight well, also, I mean, that's US cars, of course, the weight is a lot higher. Okay, so this is how we're looking at data. So it's really cool because every time we see something interesting, we can just look at this specifiedly, and then it can also show us, like, related views, like, you might also be interested in this, um, and then also adding new quantitative fields to all kinds of stuff. So in the end, you get a really... Um, you start really broadly, and you end really with really specific plots, which is a really nice thing about data Voyager. And while doing this exploratory analysis, you always bookmark all the plots you think are interesting um, with a comment. And then in the end, you can just export them. And then again, so this is only the demo on this liga.github.io page. So I can only export um, 
this Vega Lite code, like the JSON code, if, I, if the Jupyter Lab extension was working, which it currently isn't, um, as I already showed the others, um, I could also export it as an Altair plot, which I can just directly embed into my Python code, which is really nice. Okay, um, as much for the data voyager, like I said, a nice tool for data exploration um, to make your own plots and then you can make your own plots. Yeah. I mean, well, actually, I don't know. I only try to copy the code. Can I? So no, not on the demo. So on the Jupyter Lab extension, there is a menu where you can actually download all of these. Um, like I said, unfortunately, it's pretty much broken. Um, Jesus. If it was working, I would have. Man. Can I see that here? I should have it active actually, so I can open with, and then I can open with Voyager. So that's because, like, here are the installation up, wherever I just was. So on the GitHub, if you Google. Uh, Voyager Jupyter Hub extension. You can in the, there are the instructions on how to install the lab extension, and then I can on every JSON and CSV data set, I can open with and then Voyager, and then we have the same thing here. So I'm just looking at this data set, and everything works the same way. And normally there would be buttons right here, yeah. And there's for example this export is Vega light, but this is also broken. So I can randomly find it. Oh no, oh, this actually worked. So I can export as Vega Lite. Oh, that's, I didn't, maybe I just didn't find the right button. Ah, oh, that one said undo. Copy Altair graph. But this doesn't work, so if I now, um, nope, that's what I copied earlier. So this copy Altair graph function is unfortunately broken. So it would be there, uh, first of all, you don't see it, and then, you find it and you're happy because you think you got it, but it's broken right now. So as soon as they update it and let the build pass, um, we could see the nice Altair plot exported by this Voyager extension. Unfortunately, not yet. No, that's a Vega Light specification. Okay. So that's what I that's what Rüdiger told on Tuesday that um, all these Altair plots are simply some Python code that translate this Python code into this Vega Lite representation, and that's like a, a JSON-based um, graph representation. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not too hard to where we create this very plot. So what I did here now, if I, if I would be interested in this plot, well, what am I doing here? I'm plotting cylinders against name. So I can simply um, code the very same thing in Altea, and here uh, Altea.mark point, I don't know, this, is, this wasn't point, but whatever, Altea.mark, whatever I want to encode, and then have y equals and x equals the, the right thing. So you can't simply recreate it. It's like it's, it's never more than like three items. So what are we plotting against what with what other specifications? And that's pretty much it. Um, so we could recreate it also manually, um, or we could wait until this button is fixed again and um, the build is passing on GitHub. Voyager, I guess. Yeah, but it's like it produces the very same plots as if you would use Altair because Altair translates to this um, Vega Lite language and Voyager translates to this Vega Lite language. Um, it's just a nice user interface to do so instead of having to code your Python code. Yeah, so like I said, as soon as it works again, um, I could show you how to, um, well, 
or to export something here. Doesn't work right now, um, which is unfortunate. Let's hope it gets fixed soon. Okay, um, as much for Voyager here, and this is an iframe with the same thing. Uh, here are further readings about that, blah, blah. And you can look into it if you're interested. So this is a paper about this Vega Light language, um, which basically uh, came with the first version of Voyager, or rather the other way around. Okay, so as much for data analysis and interactive data analysis. Um, now I'm gonna talk really quick about performance optimization as our very last topic. Uh, as a reminder, next Thursday we have the exam. So oh yeah, I did. I forgot that to mention. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, at the beginning. So I sent the uh, emails again with your status report, and then like ten people told me that I had an error in homework eight. So the script somehow failed on homework eight, um, just because it lost connection while connecting to GitHub. Uh, so it's updated now. Now it should be correct. So if, if you had only homework eight failing, I've updated that now. And then also uh, I had information about the exam in that. Uh, if you want to write the exam, look into that, write me an email that you want to write the exam. Um, and yeah, the exam is next Thursday. It's gonna be here. You're gonna use your own laptop and we're gonna use this Jupyter Hub instance, which uh, Rüdiger showed on Tuesday in which we made the announcement, announcement a few days ago. You are allowed to use everything, so coffer closure. Um, you're allowed to use the internet, you're allowed to use Stack Overflow. You are supposed to use your own laptop. If you couldn't bring a laptop, let me know. We need to figure something out in that case. Um, you're not allowed to communicate with others. Um, so every kind of messenger or something is uh, not allowed. And we will see if you do that because there are only like 10 people writing the exam maximally. So we uh, will see if you're texting. But if you want to communicate over Stack Overflow but make a, a normal Stack Overflow post according to the principle of Stack Overflow, that's also fine for me. Um, but yeah, so uh, cover closure, you can use everything. You do, you're working on your own laptop. You won't have any problems with the libraries. Thanks to the uh, Jupyter Hub instance, we won't grade it automatically. So that, but we will simply look at it such that you're not busy for 10 seconds for the actual code and then for half an hour for this last pixel perfect match. So uh, don't be bothered about that. That won't happen in the exam. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about this. So next Tuesday, there won't be new content, but simply um, a question and answer session for the exam until then we have the exam ready. And yes, I think that's pretty much it about the exam. Okay, no questions to that. Then I have this one last topic of performance optimization. Um, and I'm just gonna talk real quick about different ways of making your code faster. So Python is a really inefficient language. Python is one of the slow, like Python is the slowest normally used language, right? So it's even slower than Java, which has to make its own virtual machine because Python is live inter interpreted, right? If, you if you're programming in C, what's gonna happen is when you compile your C code, it's gonna be directly compiled into assembler code and assembler code is targeted to your very CPU, into your very system, it's gonna be really efficient and it's gonna be really fast. So every language right now compares itself with C. There are some new languages which are almost as fast as C um, and sometimes even like, like as efficient and fast as C as um, for example Rust, which is, which is why Rust is so uh, famous right now. Um, Python is famous right now because it's a really easy language, but again, Python is one of the slowest languages. Um, there are some nice features like for example this number which I'm going to show you later in Cython, which um, and actually even NumPy. So the, the nice thing about NumPy is that NumPy works, like, not, like everything NumPy does, it does in C. So NumPy uses C functions to do the code and then just, so when you call a NumPy function, it's gonna do whatever you want to do in C code, which is fast and efficient and nice, and then gonna hand over the result back to you in Python so that you can continue working on it, which is why, Num, uh, which is why NumPy is so much faster than Python. And there are other ways to achieve the same thing. For example, what this number simply does, it simply translates it into C2, into C comma T-O-O. So this is also really nice. 
Um, Cython is the explicit version of that. So Cython is a way to incorporate C code in your Python code. What you do if you want to use Cython, you simply, so the nice thing about Python is also the reason why Python is one of the clearest languages. And that is because it's um, of its uh, data typing, because it doesn't have any typing at all. You can have a variable, which is first a string, and then an integer, and then a boolean, and then a string again, and Python doesn't care at all. This is really, really nice, but also makes it really efficient, uh, really inefficient. Um, other, like the stronger a language is typed, um, the faster, the more efficient it's going to be, because all the time you're doing something in Python, it needs to check, well, yes, I have this variable here, but that's only a name to something which is standing right there. So let's head over there. And then does this even support the method I want to have? But this method is given here. So that's all taking really long because it needs to jump around in um, the realm of your computer all the time. And having a strictly typed language is much faster. So what Cython is going to be, it's simply going to, so you add annotations of uh, variable implementations of what variable type this variable is supposed to be. And then once you did that and did some other stuff, you can simply translate your code into faster C code, which is a really, really nice thing because C is running really fast. And then you can include that C code in your normal Python code such that every time critical function you can simply execute as the C function outside of your normal Python code. So Cython and number are two really nice ways of including the more efficient language C and also NumPy um, in is a ways of including the more efficient language C in your more well convenient Python code because Python is one of the most convenient languages. And the last thing, um, I don't have anything about it, it's just a note that distributed computing will also make it faster. So simply executing something on multiple cores or multiple machines at the same time. It's far more complex. That would require a few lectures on its own, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but what I'm going to talk about, except number and Cython for a second, is uh, parallelism. So obviously, if you have a computer which has multiple CPUs, it can compute multiple things at the same time. Problem is, Python almost never can, because Python, like I said, is a really inefficient language, and Python is an interpreted language. And the problem of Python is the global interpreter lock, which means that this interpreter of Python, so you have Python is interpreted line by line. You know, C is compiled into this assembler code, and then you have, you're only working with this assembler code, which is targeted to your machine, and then you're running this efficiently and good. Python is always, it's never going to be um, compiled, but it's interpreted line by line. So a Python code, the same thing as we saw in week nine when we looked at the debugger, it's going to look at this line, it's going to translate this line into the, um, into the code for your machine on the fly, and then it's going to translate the next line and the next line and the next line. And even if in Python we're doing parallelism, this interpreter which interprets your line and translates it to C, this only runs in one thread. That's the global interpreter lock in Python. That means even if you multi-threading your task and you're having like execute this script from start to finish simultaneously with this script from start to finish simultaneously with this script from start to finish, which you would assume would work if you have multiple CPU cores, doesn't because this execute this line thingy only once in one thread and that's the global interpreter look. And that's why multi-threading in Python is a really hard, th uh, is a really um, hard thing and often really not much more efficient than not even multi-threading your code. So, but let's start with this actual uh, notebook. First of all, what is even the difference? So I talked about multi-threading and multi-processing now. What is the difference between multi-threading and multi-processing? So I stole, I stole this here from uh, the operating system lectures. So normally, um, if we have only one thread, so if our if we don't parallelize our program where we have only one thread of control. So we have some function here, and then at some certain point it calls another function, then this function once, yeah? and then once this function is done, it's going to return something, and only afterwards our original caller function is going to get back the attention of the CPU, and it's going to continue, and it's going to call another function, which then has full attention of a CPU. It's going to return eventually, and then our main function again gets full attention of the CPU and so on and so on. 
So when a thread calls a subroutine, uh, there's still only one thread of control. And so the thread of control then wants a subroutine. And once the subroutine is done, the thread of control, the one thread of, your to of control, if you're single-threaded, um, gets back the attention of a CPU. So what multi-threading does is where we can have multiple threads in parallel. So we have this one thread of control, which runs all the time. And when it wants a subroutine, a th like not a subroutine, but a thread, this thread can run in parallel. Okay? So when a thread starts another thread, there's a new thread of control that runs in parallel with the original one and can even continue once the original one terminates. So this terminates here, and the others are still active and terminate well, when they are terminating, right? OK, um, so like I said, Python is hard to make multi-threaded because of the global interpreter lock. The interpreter wants only one thread. All the nice threads you're producing only one in this thread, too. Um, there's a difference between multi-threading and multi-processing. Multi-processing finds the way you want that. So um, that's nice, but even multi-threading can sometimes be of use. So while multi-threading cannot be in parallel, that means you don't, you never have, when you're multi-threading in Python, you never have, if you have, for example, four CPU cores and you're having four threads, it's never going to be the case that each thread is executing, uh, each CPU core is executing one thread truly in parallel. They can still be concurrent. Right? The difference between parallel and concurrent is that parallel processing can run truly at the same time simultaneously on different CPUs and CPU cores. So core A, thread A, core B, thread B at the very same time. That can't be the case with multithreading in Python, but with multithreading in Python, this can still be concurrent. Concurrent processes appear to be parallel to most of the system. Even the CPU handles them one after another, so either parallel or interlocked. So interlocked is what we're seeing here. So this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, or parallel, where, well, a teeny tiny bit of this one, then a teeny tiny bit of this one. So uh, I can't show it with this image, but so like I said, interlocked, yeah, this, 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 this. And if they would seem parallel, yeah, not concurrent, but parallel, it would execute a teeny tiny bit of this one, then a teeny tiny bit of this one, then the next bit of this one, then the next bit of this one, and so on and so on. Um, and that's on occasion still faster. Now the question is, when is that still faster than having only one thread? And the obvious answer is, well, in cases where the CPU isn't the bottleneck. So imagine you have a network connection. So what happens if you have a network connection? Um, the CPU is only going to get the instruction, open this network connection, send some request, I want to have this kind of data, and then wait for the request, and then wait for the request and then wait for the request. So the CPU is simply idling and like, yeah, I'm just going to be interrupted as soon as I get um, the response from the server. And that's the perfect moment where um, some concurrent process is still more efficient than non-concurrent process. Because while this one thread here is simply doing nothing and idling and waiting for the network, this one can run much, far, run much more and because it gets more CPU time. OK, that was understandable. OK, so while CPU intense processes are only truly sped up when they are parallel, truly at the same time on different cores, which can't be done with Python's multi-threading, tasks that have a bottleneck in network or disk access, like disk access is also so much slower in comparison to web access, like, or like thousands of orders of magnitude. So RAM is so much faster than your disk, even if you have SSD. And thinking like getting something from the disk takes like really a few milliseconds, whereas everything else um, on the CPU takes fractions of nanoseconds. So everything where you have a bottleneck and disk or network access, so every time where you actually use disk or network access, um, that's moments where you help from concurrent execution already. So that's where multi-threading is also helping you. OK, now I talked a lot about this multi-threading and multi-processing, what actually are multi-threading and multi-processing. Again, I also stole this from uh, introduction to operating systems. So multi-threading, um, so to a process, there's a lot of information for the computer. So if we look at the test manager, we see that there are multiple process active or that, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, so if I would open my, 
So we see many hello, many processes here, yeah, or rather let's look at here. So we see that there are many processes open at the same time, like the ones at the top have more attentions than the one at the bottom, blah, blah. We see that. I have really many Firefox stuff, which is why such a high memory consumption. I really should get rid of that. Um, but yeah, so there are multiple processes on a computer. And on the computer, there's a lot of information for all these processes, like the state of the process, if it's ready, so in the background, running, which is currently this very window, or an active, which are well, other at the background. The program counter, like, like I said, so where in, so for example, in Python interpreted language, where in my code am I actually? So am I in line one or line two? So which is the current command? The CPU registers, so cached information. So I said the ROM is much faster than accessing something from the disk, but there's also a cache on the CPU, which if you look at, uh, like if you look at CPUs to buy, um, cache is also something really important because the higher the cache, um, the faster access to all, all kinds of stuff because like CPU registers are still all magnitude faster than your one. Scheduling information, like what's the priority of this task because if you only have like, I have like hundreds of processes open here and I have only eight, eight, eight cores and I think only eight cores. So it can't execute like all my Firefox windows at the same time. So they are scheduled and one are just not active and so they have a priority and a position. Storage information, I always say this, like did I have open files, open network connections, all that kinds of stuff. And when switching a process, which the computer does all the time, like it needs to update, for example, the clock every minute. It needs to, I don't know, show me notifications when I get an email. It needs to look at if I still have Wi-Fi connection, all that stuff. So it switches processes all the time. And the problem is if I'm switching processes, all this information needs to be saved somewhere such that the CPU can load some other process with all this information. And then eventually, and then this process here is frozen and like the new process is loaded and also eventually saved and frozen and so on and so on. So this produces a lot of overhead. So this is necessary when I'm simply having like Firefox doesn't share the same information as, uh, I don't know, my Python instance. So it's necessary that they are separate processes. But if I have something inside my program, it's not necessary because some information is shared. And that's what we have a thread for. So threads are basically lightweight processes using shared resources. So the shared storage space, shared program code. So if I'm simply, well, having one Python code which um, executes multiple threads, it obviously shares the same program code, shared virtual files, also in part shared IO status, and so on and so on. And this is, of course, much faster to switch because if I only need to store a bit of this when I'm switching threads, it's much faster. Okay, so most operating systems use threads to let's program search control without the overhead of having to save and load all the information. Threads are differently, differently implemented in Windows and Linux. If you're interested in that, uh, just go to the operating system section. Okay, so what are the advantages of threads? Like I said, much faster creation and task switching efficient communication because they have some kind of shared resources. If I have different processes, I can only like, well, literally sh save a file somewhere on the RAM and then let the other program look at this portion of the RAM. And that's produce a lot of overhead. And on threads, I can simply say, hey, thread, notify your other thread. And that's really nice. And then the operating system doesn't schedule them. So if I have one process with multiple threads, my operating system, the schedule of my operating system will only say this process is active now and it doesn't care which thread of that is active now. Okay, so my program decides which thread of my process is active, the operating system decides which process is active. That's a nice trade-off. So we can implement our own scheduling. If we say this one needs to be done really in real-time priority and the other ones are not as important, I can implement it myself. But that's also a disadvantage because, well, the operating system doesn't schedule them. So it's hard to synchronize um, with other threads and with um, other processes. Um, processes are better isolated because, like I said, it has like, this, all this kind of shared stuff. And that also leads to the problem that, for example, when one of the threads crashes, my entire process crashes. If I have multiple processes, if one process crashes, it doesn't affect the others. If I have one crashing thread, well, some memory overflow or something is going to happen in this shared space, 
So the memory overflow is there for all threads, and all threads crash. And like I said, Python can't use them for parallel processing due to the global interpreter lock. Whew. OK, as much theoretical information, let's look at how do we actually do this. So let's look at our simple function here. We have some random array here. And we have simply a function that sorts this array. np.sort is not in place, so it returns something. It doesn't use the return value, but um, it's only like it needs to be sorted over and over all the time when you execute it over and over. So let's do this. Let's call this function 100 times and then look how long this takes. Last time I executed this, it took seven seconds. And it's going to take roughly the same amount now. So sorting one million numbers 100 times takes 7.3 something th seconds. So let's look if threading makes this faster. How to use threading where we simply import threading. And then we make an empty list of threads. Yeah? And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a thread, which is well, an object of type threading.thread. And then when calling this uh, constructor of the threading.thread, .thread, we have to say which is the target function which this thread has to execute. And this target function, this thread, which we're creating here called t, has to execute is this sort of function. Then we append this thread the t to a list of threads, and then we start it. So what we do when creating a thread, we have to call the constructor of threading.thread, specifying a target function, which is well some piece of our code. And we have to add this to our list of threads. Why do we have this to add this to our list of threads? Well, normally we, we wouldn't need to, but I have to. Uh, so if I only start this thread, I already showed you before um, on this very image here. When, one th when the thread of control ends, yeah, the other threads can still be running. But um, like, I, I don't see if the others are still running because as soon as my main thread, like the one where this very code here is executed, ends, um, I get back, like my Python will say, yep, this thread is done, I'm done here. And if I want to wait for the other threads, I have to join them. So this here, doesn't take much time at all. So it only creates, an, for this thread, it runs from here to there. It runs 100 times. It creates the new thread, and then it's done. And then it would be done far faster than the actual sorting in these other threads. So this would run from start to finish and would be done. And if I wouldn't join the other threads, which means wait until this thread is done, uh, it would tell me it would be done in Almost no time. OK, I should add uh, the time it took. So I'm done in 1.44 seconds. Or actually, I think in this case, it did wait for the other ones. Because I think if I'm waiting for them, it's <laughs> because I think if I'm waiting for them, it's also 1.44 something seconds. Ah, OK. So. It's a bit slower. So we see here that creating these threads here takes 1.4 seconds. And then we have 100 threads, which all do this sorting in parallel. And this only adds like 0.2 seconds overhead. So this creates the threads. And now, so from here on, there are going to be much, like 101 threads running in parallel. And then here, I tell my main thread, yeah, but please wait for other threads. This is why I added them all to my list. If I would have lost the, um, the pointer to my thread, which I'm saving as this variable t here, uh, without appending it to my list, I could never join this thread. And I would never, well, my main thread could, could just couldn't reach it, couldn't communicate with it. So this here is one kind of communication between threads. My main thread says, well, daughter thread, once you're done, please let me know. And then I'm waiting until then. So this waits until all the daughter threads are done. And then my main thread prints the time. And so this here, as we see, 1.6 something seconds much faster um, than doing them not in parallel. So this is threading. Again, um, this, is, this only works because uh, this is only so much faster because um, there's a lot of overhead of having to save these on the RUM and accessing them from the RUM and making and reordering them in the RUM and making a new error in the RUM. So this is a task which somehow has a bottleneck in the RUM, even if you wouldn't assume it. 
if you would assume it would be a bottleneck in the CPU, it also has inefficiencies in your random access memory, so it also benefits a bit from threading. But if you are, um, so if you, if you're unsure, look at the timing and look if your threading, uh, if your multi-threading actually makes something more efficient, because a lot of times it doesn't. So when we, for example, had the, um, at this class at Likos, this nature-inspired algorithms thingies, uh, for example, the ant colony optimization, every single, I looked at every single uh, implementation of my year, including the one of my group, the, they all tried some kind of multi-threading and it all didn't help performance at all. Because this ant colony optimization, like it relies on, ah, it was a long time ago, I forgot why the multi-threading didn't help, but I simply plotted the time with them without multi-threading and it was, slower or just as fast with the multi-processing, multi-threading. So it didn't, it never helped. So pay attention when this helps. Um, if threading doesn't help, doesn't make something faster, you can still try multi-processing, but keep in mind that multi-processing has a lot of overhead to create the new processes. Because what this multi-processing does, it simply creates a new process by saying, well, everything, every information about this current process, let's copy it somewhere else and let's have that then too. This copying somewhere else can take a lot of time and that's like a constant time of overhead. So multiprocessing is only faster if, well, something actually benefits from this multiprocessing as much that it makes up for the overhead of creating the new process. Okay, yeah, recipe for creating threads, create a child thread, uh, save the reference we need later. Uh, your main thread can continue, we start the thread and then we join to let the main thread wait. Okay, after this very simple example, I have uh, a bigger example. Um, we won't go through this code. So what this code here does, yeah, is it goes on imager using the request library. We saw that already in one example on week nine. Going to the API of imager and just looking at the hottest viral videos of the uh, images of the month. Yeah, using the request library, and then getting all the links of that, and then downloading all the links. Now I said downloading all the links, that's obviously something um, where the bottleneck is the network access, access. So if I had that only in one thread, it would get the first link and say, yes, imager server, please give me that link, I'm gonna wait. And then it's gonna wait and wait and wait until the imager server responds and actually send the image, which takes some time because the imager server is of course in far away. Um, if I do that multi-processed or multi-threaded, it both gains efficiency because my first thread says, imager server, please give me the first image. Hey, and why are you doing that? Instead of waiting, imager server, please also give me the second. Hey, and why are you doing that? Please also give me the third and so on and so on. So this is something where multi-processing and multi-threading both provide efficiency. Uh, let me first delete this folder because this is where the images actually get and execute this, these are only the functions of how to get the links, how to download things, blah, blah. And let's do that single-threadedly. So what I'm doing here is I'm downloading the first two pages here. So you see I created the images page here and it downloads the images here. So I have no fucking clue what's currently on Imager. So, oh yeah, the Pikachu image is still, oh yeah, copied fortune code. Uh, so yeah, obviously this is Imager. Um, so it downloaded a lot of images from the first two pages. So these are, I think, I don't know, there are 10 images per page, but sometimes it's a gallery. So it's gonna be between 20 and 20 times average number of images per gallery on Imager. Images, which we downloaded here. And so it takes some time. It takes really long because you can only download one image after the other. It requests an image. Image, please give me that image. It waits, 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 waits. Request the next image. Image, please give me that image. Waits, 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 and so on and so on. It takes really long time, as you see. So why we're waiting for this? We won't wait for this. We're also working in parallel because we're better than that. Okay. So ah, it took 75 seconds. Wow. Oh, Set nonsense for 60 seconds. Um, 75 seconds. Okay, so the same version. So we saw here how we did that. Yeah, we simply, um, this year simply got all the links. This links here now, 
um, is simply a list of links of where to find links. So list of links of where to find an, an image. And then this download link simply uses the API to download the link. So if we look at this link here, it's some imager image. OK? And then so we iterate through all this entire list and download the link. So this uh, benefits, of course, from multithreading. So let's look at how we do that. Um, we now need this queue. A queue is a data type uh, first in, first out. So right, the, the first thing that comes it gets added to the queue is the first thing we get when we pull the queue, of course. And uh, why do we need the queue? Because queues are thread safe. Because we have the problem that all our threads, so first we create this list once, right? We create this list of links here. We have one list of links, and then there are multiple threads accessing this list. Um, this can lead to waste conditions. We saw waste conditions and stuff. We had that in Informatic B, right? Informatic B it was. So, if you want to look that up, look at informatic B. So multiprocessing is sometimes really hard because you have weight, well, because you have waste conditions, dining, philosoph dining philosophers uh, problem, or whatever the other problems are. So we can imagine when two, th so there are sometimes moments where two threads are waiting for the other. So thread A is for thread B to finish, and thread B is waiting for thread A to finish, and then the integer is going to run infinitely until you stop the process. OK, so that's why we need this queue, because it's thread safe. It doesn't care, so it, it pays attention that the threads are accessing it uh, simultaneously and not at the same time, and one after the other, um, to, dis so to forbid these certain kinds of waste conditions. OK, and now we're doing something a bit differently. So first of all, so in our last example, we created a thread by calling the constructor of thread. Now we're making a child of this thread class. And we're overwriting the init and the run function. So the run function is what's going to be run if I'm calling thread.start. OK? And when initializing it, well, first of all, we have to initialize like the, the, uh, the mother, the thread. And then here we uh, have this argument, our queue, our thread safe queue, which is there for all threads. And it's a very same disable queue for all threads. And every thread saves a reference to that. And then what all our threads do is they run infinitely and get some new element from this queue, uh, download it, and then notify the queue that they successfully downloaded this very link such that the queue can say, OK, next thread, when you're looking for an item, don't look at this one because this one is already done. OK, and then the queue um, can then stop all threads because once all the links from the queue are downloaded, the queue can tell our main thread, hey, oh, so I am empty, my threads used me, so I guess I'm, uh, I'm guess we're done here now. OK, and then we're doing the same thing. We set the download here. We make this, links, this list of links. Then we create our queue to communicate with the worker threads. We create eight worker threads. Why do I create eight? Because I have, I think, eight cores in my CPU. Um, so it, it, it does make sense sometimes, because like I said, the network is a bottleneck. But generally, it's, uh, most of the time, it's, it's a right choice to have as many um, threads as you have CPU cores. I think more would even be more efficient here because the network is a bottleneck, but whatever. OK, and then we create a download worker here. We say that it's a daemon. A daemon lets the main thread exit even though the workers are blocking. Um, in fact, because we're joining all threads afterwards, yeah, queue.join, it's basically the same thing because all, like, the queue knows all threads and the threads know, all know the queue, so that's nice. Uh, so we, can, we don't need to save the threads in a list again, but we can simply use this queue in the end. And then, yeah, what we do is we go through our list and simply add these links, uh, this every link from our list to the queue, because the queue is thread safe, thread safe, our list wasn't. And then, yeah, once this happens, uh, automatically the threads are going to, ah, there's a new element in my queue. There's a new element in my queue. They're going to download, download, download. And then eventually, once uh, everything is downloaded, the queue is done. Our thread sets the queue that the task is done. And then we can join, join the queue. That, again, causes the main thread to wait um, to, for the queue to finish posting all the tasks. And that, then, is much faster than our 75 seconds. OK, now we have this download worker, which is a Python thread on every iteration of its one. It calls save.queue.get, which fetches the URL from the thread thread queue. Once the worker receives an item, it calls download link. Must six in the queue that the task is done, um, because otherwise this queue.join wouldn't well, would wait forever. And yeah, 
So this is, this is concurrent, but not parallel due to Python's global temperature lock, but still it's faster because the network has a bottleneck, the processor is mostly waiting and can pick up working on the thread as soon as the network is done. Now, 28 seconds in contrast to 75, we saw it's much faster. Okay, let's go to multi-processing. If code is performing a CPU-heavy task, the execution time will be slower, probably. For such tasks, so because the, of the overhead of creating a new process. Uh, for such tasks, we need the multiprocessing module. To use multiprocessing, what we generally do is Python has this one way of you using the multiprocessing. So mul multiprocessing is hard, and like it's, it's really like a, a, it's like a hard thing to program in general. In C, what you would use is the fork operator, which simply, literally, wherever I'm now, I'm just going to create the exact copy of this, and then you have to differentiate between this and the exact copy by a single number. So, and then you say, if my process ID is this, continue this, and if my process ID is not this, then I'm the child um, process, then I'm doing this. This is hard to implement, and Python assumes Python users uh, can't do this, which is why Python provides basically one really, really simple interface to multiprocessing, which is supposed to use and nothing else. And this is multiprocessing.pool. So to use multiprocessing in Python, uh, what we generally do is we create this pool, which provides a method map and some others. And this method then, for our example, we pass a list of URLs, which then automatically spawns the individual processes that can execute and download the images, truly parallel on my eight cores. And yeah, as mentioned above, um, the entire memory of the script must be copied, including all of its overheads, so we have a lot of overhead of creating this. Okay, so what we're doing here is we simply, from multiprocessing.pool, yes, there are other interfaces to multiprocessing, but the normally, one, the normally used one is this pool. So we import the pool from multiprocessing.pool. Uh, we have basically the same things as before. We create a donut, we create the list of links. I make a new function uh, as a partial function because um, I didn't want to, I wanted to make it look as easy as possible. So I could also provide the arguments here, but this is simply a partial function where these two links are already provided. Um, easy thing. And then what we're simply doing is we have with pool and then the number of processes, sp, p.map, our function, which is this function, our list, which is this list, done. And then Python automatically is gonna, it's gonna know, okay, what I'm gonna do here is for every element, so I'm creating eight processes, and then I'm going through this list, and whichever process is currently doing nothing, this is gonna execute the download function on one not yet used element from the list links. This, um, so there are some, well, it looks, well, it doesn't look much like it, except now here we're going through all the links, and here we're simply saying, well, give me eight processes and map the entire thing. So this map function is something uh, which we had in the second lecture, right? So Python has some functional elements, and this is like a functional element, right? So map this function to all, element, to all elements of this list. Um, and if we have this multiprocessing pool, it simply maps this function to all elements of this list in parallel with eight threads, with eight processes. And then we're done already, uh, 28 seconds, pretty much the same time as, so even a teeny tiny bit slower than using multi-threading, like I said, because creating the processes has overhead and because the network is the bottleneck here, we don't have too much gain. Okay. Good, so. Uh, like I said, the interface for multiprocessing in Python is this pool.map. There are also some other things. So there's map and imap and map async. And, uh, and imap unordered. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. There are some others. Uh, and they work all roughly the same. They have a teeny tiny difference. So this here is copied from Stack from Stack Overflow. And so that this really confused me because it's really badly written in the documentation. And I hate the documentation for this. Uh, so I copied this because it explains it much better. So we have this pool.map. And my pool.map does, it consumes my iterable, my list of links here, uh, this here. Um, by converting the iterable to a list, assume it isn't one already, where mine was, so it doesn't need to. Backend into chunks and sending those chunks to the worker processes in the pool. So 
it knows if this list has 80 entries and they have eight processes, it will simply say, first process, you do the first 10, second one, you do the second 10, third one, you do the third 10. So this performs good. Um, uh, well, breaking the iterable into chunks performs better than passing each item in the iterable between process one at a time if the iterable is large. However, turning it into a list in order to chunk it can have a high memory cost since the entire list will need to be kept in memory. Because like here map is the right thing to do because my links list is already a list here. Yeah? If I would provide only this iterable here instead of the list, then it would need to well, create a list out of this and then chunk this list. And this can take some time and it's sometimes inefficient and sometimes there are better ways to do this. Okay, so um, if we're, so this is how my, uh, this map works, okay? So we're mapping the function that simply returns the number of seconds plus two here yeah? um, after sleeping for the number of seconds. And then we're mapping this function to one, five, and three. So there's going to be one thread, uh, one process that waits one second and then returns three, one that waits five seconds and then returns seven, and one that waits three seconds and then returns five. So if I'm mapping, what do I see here? I'm done once the I'm done after seven seconds, after five seconds. So once this, the slowest one is done. So what we see here also is that map returns a list once every process is done. There's a faster way of where we just don't wait for the other, um, like until the entire list is done, and that's IMAP. Um, so what IMAP does, so first of all, we don't give IMAP the list, um, and it doesn't then break it into chunks because it doesn't create a list out of this but will iterate over the iterable one element at a time and send them each to a worker process. So first process, you have nothing to do, take the first, second process, nothing to do, take the third, the first, you're done, okay, take the third, and so on and so on. Okay, so we don't take the memory hit of converting the whole table to a list, but it also means the performance is sometimes slower because of the lack of chunking and because it always needs to like distribute um, in this one controlling thread um, simultaneously. Uh, we can provide a chunk size argument, but yeah. And then we still have the difference between this IMAP, so it will be map here, and IMAP unordered, as well as map and map asynchronous. That is that with the well, uh, IMAP and IMAP unordered, we can start receiving results from workers as soon as they are ready, rather than having to wait for them all to be finished. So we see here all three of them, finished at the same time after five seconds, if I would have used IMAP, that wouldn't be the case. With mapper sync, some result is returned right away, but we can't use it anyway, so mapper sync is bullshit. Um, so let's do the very same thing here with IMAP now. We see it. I simply changed the word map to IMAP. And now I'm expecting three, seven, and five appearing once they're ready, but in the original order, because I don't have IMAP unordered. So it still wants the original order. So we return one after one second, then it will return five after five seconds, and while it's doing this, it's also returning this three after five, uh, this, well, this, okay, seven after five seconds, and then three after five seconds. This is faster done than this, but this needs to wait for this such that the order stays the same. And this is why for the first one, I'm waiting one second, and for the second and third one, I'm waiting five seconds. If I don't care about the order, I can use IMAP unordered. Um, with IMAP here, we see the results will be yielded from the iterator here as soon as they're ready, which is why they are faster done than before, uh, the first one. Still preserving the original order. With IMAP unordered, they will be yielded as soon as they are ready. So this is the fastest one for this because the first one will only take one second, the second one will only take three seconds, and only the last one will take five seconds. We lost our original order. It's now 357 instead of 375. Uh, 357 seven. instead of 37 instead of 153, so 375, um, but it's faster. Yeah, as much for multiple multiprocessing. Okay, okay. Um, Python does provide the possibility for asynchronous programming. So asynchronous programming is another way to achieve, um, well, parallel processing um, by simply 
not having this one function that waits for other functions. So when you have asynchronous programming, no function ever waits for other functions. So when I call another function, I'm just calling that and then continuing with my code, no matter what the, like, and I can't return something from the other function. If you're doing asynchronous programming, which is a paradigm mostly known from JavaScript, so if you're working with JavaScript, you have to get used to that because JavaScript really much relies on that. Um, so you never can, so you, you, you can never return function, you can never return stuff from functions because the caller function doesn't wait for this function to return, right? So this is um, synchronous programming. So I have one thread, which call, like I have one function which calls a subfunction which then returns something and so on and so on. So if I had the same thing um, in async, where my one thread would call this function, and, where, and then this part would be here, and it would give an error here, because where it relies on this return value for which it would have to go back in time, which is impossible, so I'm having, I'm having an error here. Instead, when you're doing um, asynchronous programming, what you have to do instead is you have to give the function you're calling a callback function. So I'm calling another function, do whatever you want to do, and once you're done, yeah, please call this function. And then this function, which so function one calls function two and says once you're done, call function three, such that function three can then work with the result of function two because that's certainly only called after function two is done. That's a pretty much different program paradigm. paradigm. Um, it it's, takes a bit to get used to. I only have this one video here where a guy explains it because I've never really worked with that and I'm not the best guy to explain that. Um, but yeah, uh, it's referred to this guide here where I also took the first, like the example with the, uh, with the imager downloader here. I'm referring to this because I'm not the best one to explain this. So if you're interested in that, it's sometimes really useful because it can be more efficient because you have like other ways of thinking about your problem and not having like, okay, now I'm starting eight threads in parallel and then this is happening and then this is happening, but simply you're, okay, what does this piece of logic need to do? This, then this, and this, and this, okay. Let it do its shit and then this piece of logic, what does this need to do, blah, blah, blah. So it's another way of thinking. It can be much faster, but takes a lot, like it, it takes a bit to, to get used to. But if you're coming from JavaScript, it's not too hard. And Python provides the keywords, async and await, which is all that's necessary for that and then um, we're done already. So Python supports that, full stop. Okay, and then the last two things I'm gonna talk about are number and Cython. So number, uh, we showed this already in the whirlwind tour of the first week. So number is an open source just-in-time compiler that translates a subset of Python and number into fast machine code. So like I said at the beginning, Python code, inefficient, C code, or even assembler code, efficient. And number is this compiler that's in, that you give it a Python code and it's going to create efficient code from that, at least for the parts that number can. Okay? So number compiled numerical algorithms in Python can approach the uh, speeds of C and Fortran instead of having to rewrite or even recompile your code. All we need to do is adding one decorator to my function. So as one example here, Let's, uh, so this is simply well, uh, a 10 by 10 array of the numbers from zero until 99. And then we have this one function given from the number example where we calculate the trace. Uh, so how do we calculate the trace? Well, like this. <laughs> it's just a function that has a loop somewhere and then calls this NP function. This is a nice example because these are three things which number is really good at. It has, it's sufficient in loops, which is what we're having here. It's sufficient in calling NP functions, which is doing here. And it's sufficient in every broadcasting, which is doing here, because trace is a one single number, and A is a NumPy array. So these three things are efficient in NumPy, a uh, number, so that's why the example does these. But first of all, let's do it in simple Python. So apparently, the trace of this, um, of this array is nine, because it adds nine to everything. Calculate, uh, like this. You calculate the trace like this, apparently. Okay, so 
uh, and doing this, yeah, this is what uh, the result of this is. Okay, so, and what we're doing if we want to convert this inefficient and slow Python code into efficient and fast number code, is we simply add two lines where we import this number just in time compiler and then we add the decorator JIT in front of our function, uh, in front of our function. Um, we explicitly say here that no Python equals two. If we explicitly say that number is gonna try to do, to translate every single bit of that code into um, number code, and if it can't, it will raise an error. If we wouldn't have this no Python equals two, um, it would translate only the parts it can into efficient code and leave the others as Python code. Um, so you should first always try if JIT works, if number.jit works, with no Python equals true. And if you can't make it work with no Python equals true, even after rearranging it, like changing your code such that it may, then you can eventually maybe use no Python equals false. But that's a bit inefficient and more inefficient than using no Python equals true. And then, yeah, um, what we do, we need to compile the function once, which means executing it. So first, after uh, calling this function with an argument, it's going to be translated into this number code. Okay, and now, uh, so this here was a 10 by 10 array. We can do more. We can make a 100 by 100 array. Yeah, so let's do this. And let's go through it with our normal function, which we saw here before. And we see this takes, on average, 288 microseconds per one. That's really fast. 680-something, 360, okay. And then uh, let's go... Let's test uh, how the go fast how fast the go fast function is. Aha! It only takes 90 microseconds. So this is order uh, four faster. This is uh, by order four faster. Actually, this is confusing me because it, when I tried it at home, it was order 10. Ah, well, it's even less. Interesting. Okay, so it's much faster still, even even like four times. Like if you're waiting four hours or 16 hours or something, is a huge difference, right? So this is a really nice thing. You can use it, and you should use it because it's simply that you can, if you have something, try to add this edit decorator in front of the function, and maybe it will make your program much, much faster by only adding like three seconds of coding, like only adding this one decorator. So it's really worth it if it works. Um, I have, and then I have only added these three um, notebooks, which are t simply taken from the do, uh, from the number um, with the docs page, where they're showing these how to use numbers. So um, these are simply copies of the original one, where they're explaining, blah blah. Let's import number. Let's do it for one function. This is the very same function as we had before. They're explaining a bit here. Go fast is faster than go, sm go slow, and it returns the same thing, blah, blah. And yeah, so they're saying here where it works good. So number works best when using with these kinds of errors, uh, when using number errors, and these uh, Python data types, we see number would not do something much better when working with dictionaries. Well, why that? Because dictionaries have no proper representation in C. So obviously this is something where number is not, well, some higher language level, higher level language feature of Python um, where this is uh, not working so fast. So yeah, anyway, it gives you a lot of information about what it does here. So for example, like it does stuff more efficient even if you're using NumPy code. So NumPy, as I've said before, is, yeah, is also using um, C code but simply like it has the C code which is then always called from Python and then returns something to Python. And even NumPy code sometimes is more efficient than using the original Python code because um, what for example JIT also does here is, for example, this random directions function uses this spherical to Cartesian function in itself. And what this function call is for example already an overhead because well, what's going to happen here is it's like call this function. This function is a reference that's somewhere here, and then the arguments are given somewhere here, and then that's a lot of jumping around in the run. And what number, for example, also does is simply like copying all this code into the function call and reusing variables more efficiently, and so on and so on, such that even this is done faster 
um, with numbers. So there are many things which are faster than number, uh, which are faster, even if um, there are already like even if it's already NumPy functions, which should be already quite efficient. So try to use always this number decorator and see if it makes a code better. Yeah, um, number works good with NumPy. Number is also made for NumPy. And um, what's a nice thing is that, um, so numpa, num, bleh, NumPy works for different data types. And then for number, you have to explicitly, even more explicitly basically say which kind of data type you're working with. And then it's working differently well for different data types. And depending on if um, the stuff is right after each other in your one. So again, it can create u functions more efficient than NumPy, blah, blah. So it's a bit more efficient. And there are many cases where it's useful to use um, number even with NumPy. And also a really nice thing is that number provides automatic multi-threading. Um, so when using this at JIT decorator, yeah, I can simply provide the keyword parallel equals true. And then for all functions, uh, for all, for example, for all loops where I am having, where the i plus one iteration doesn't depend on values from the i-th iteration. So if I'm not reusing um, stuff from the iteration before, for all these, um, I can provide this um, number dot number dot p range instead of providing a normal range such that number knows aha I can parallelize these so number provides automatic so we simply change your ranges in cases where you don't need to to p ranges and then say number please execute this in parallel and number will execute this in parallel making it much faster so for example this here is a code um, a Monte Carlo method to find pi uh, if you if you don't know this, so pi is the ratio. If you have a square and you have a circle in it, and you're throwing random darts at it, right, which have a random distribution here, then the ratio from dots that land in the circle correspond to dots that land outside the circle is pi. Or rather, let's say, if x squared plus y squared is smaller than 1, then we add this here, we add a 1 to this value, and then 5, five times, oh, so uh, we're, we're quartering this. So uh, we're looking only at a quarter of this, actually. So if we're looking at this, then the random distribution here um, somehow encodes pi. I have looked it up before I, I looked at this, and it somehow makes sense that this somehow is a Monte Carlo method to find pi. OK, but truth is, yeah, for this example, we're only throwing random darts at our dartboard n samples times. n samples is a few thousands. So we simply, it's like we don't, we never rely on the iteration before. And this is a perfect scenario. We can simply change our range here to a p range and say, number, please make it parallel. And then what we see here is um, that calling this thing in parallel takes a quarter of the time. Um, roughly than calling it um, in serial. And again, we only change the range to a P range and edit this number decorator, and we are much faster. That's a really nice thing. And the really easiest version. So before you're thinking about multi threading and multi processing, just think about hey, can I just clamp the number decorator in front of that and s see if it's already much more efficient? And if so, you're good. And yeah, so this Monte Carlo method 3.1417, yeah, it's pretty close. So three digits of the common. Okay, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about in the last four minutes is Cython. One way to make your program run faster, compile to a faster language, to a better language, to C. So what Cython basically does, it's like an optimizing static compiler, blah, 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 blah. So what we're doing here, if we're having Cython code, is we have to add variable annotations to our Python code. Because like I said, Python, no variable annotation, like Python, um, no typing at all, um, makes it easier to read, easier to think, but slower. And if we are, so according to Cython, the only difference between Python and C is variable annotations. So what we do is we add variable annotations to our code. We say, please compile this as Cython code. And then we have this Cython code, which we can use from inside Python. 
So I'm not going to read this to you. You can read this if you want yourself. So how do we do this? So first of all, oops, first of all, we have a normal um, script. For example, this hello world, which simply prints hello world. We don't call it hello world.py, but hello world.py x. And then we have to have this setup.py um, script, which basically imports Python and simply says, well, Cythonize this program. So the setup.py to um, the ones of you who are, who are familiar with, for example, C or C++ or whatever, this is basically a make file. So when we are compiling, because now we're actually compiling the first time, because Python never compiles, um, we have to give information about what do you compile, how do you compile it, are there certain arguments, are there dependencies you need, to, you need to resolve at first, and so on and so on. And this is normally the make file, like uh, Linux users are probably used to make files and make and all that stuff. You need it for many program languages, but not for Python normally, but for Cython, because what you want to do here is you want to say, well, Cythonize this program. And then what you're simply calling is Python setup.py, which is the function here, which imports all the Cython stuff, um, build minus minus in place. So let's do that. Um, I have it here as an sh file, but I can just simply run the code from this sh file here on my terminal. So let me uh, So let me do this now. Uh, let's activate my environment, and now I'm simply running this. Said I'm simply running. Hello. Uh. I'm simply running this. Ah, that's why. No, no, that's bad. Let's stay. I'm simply running this, and now it created C code. We now created hello world.c, or hello world. Dot, is it called dot .c? I'm not sure right now, but this is C code. So if we're looking into this, we see something we don't understand because we only use two easy languages like Python. But believe me, this is some nice thing because what we can do now is we don't need to look at this file ever again. Yeah, But we can simply, when we uh, can simply import this. So we have in our directory hello underscore world, we have this hello world.c, so we can simply import hello world dot hello world. And when we're running this, um, where's my old term? Did I close it? Okay. So let's run this Python use hello world. We're running this, and it prints hello world, which is what this script here did. Uh, I mean, this script here did, but in efficient C code. Okay? So I did the same thing here with the Fibonacci sequence. It's the very same thing. I have this fib function here. And then I made, using my setup.py and my build.sh, I made this c function here. Yeah, and when I'm importing this here, uh, so this is the pure Python function. So this takes 6.67 milliseconds. Actually, I don't have any gain uh, with the Fibonacci sequence here. I, I, I hoped I would. But you're going to see that it takes just as long. If I had a more complex function where, the C, where compiling to C would be more useful, you would see that it actually has a speed benefit. This one won't. But we can simply, again, we're simply importing this from Fibonacci, which is this directory, dot fib. We're importing the function fib, which is specified now in this C file. And if we're running this, so we will probably, ah, now it's even slower. So let's do it as long. So now it looks faster. Um, so yeah, if it would be a more complex function, we would have a lot of speed gain, especially if you're working with input, out, input output, for example. Like, for example, I have one, fun, like one hobby project right now on a Raspberry Pi where I'm calling the GPIOs all the time. And that's just a thousandfold increase uh, in speed when compiling it with Cython, which is really nice because I just figured that out a few days ago. Um, I wanted to show you that, but then I didn't want to bring the Pi, and that was too annoying. But believe me, Sometimes really efficient to compile to Python, uh, Cython. Okay, yeah, and then the last thing would be distribute, 
distributed computing. So I recommend looking into Dask if you're interested, but it's too much for this lecture. It's like using a cluster of computers and so on. Like it's, it's nothing we are concerned with right now for now. Okay, then I would be done. Thank you for your attention. Uh, have a nice day. I see you Tuesday or Thursday. Or not at all if, you don't writing the, if you're not writing the exam. Thank you. Like I said, Tuesday is only question answering because it doesn't make much sense. So I have one more notebook actually. So I have this here, this study A to Z, um, which I also showed in front of two people last year. If you want to look into it, you can look into it. Um, but I don't see the point of doing this for two people because I don't assume too many people are going to come on Tuesday and then we're just going to have the question answer for the exam, which I think makes more sense. Also das, die Sache ist ja, äh, für, für Coxis kann das ja was bringen, weil das ja jetzt in Modul reingeht in Zukunft. Ja. Für alle anderen macht das halt auch nicht, keine Ahnung, ich weiß halt nicht, wo, also brauchst du irgendwas hier von mir, oder? Ich weiß es nicht. Ich habe gefragt, könnten das vielleicht für drei Punkte anrechnen lassen? Nur mit Note? Das würde nur Sinn machen mit Note. Hm. Wir haben eigentlich keinen Platz für Unruf. Ja, dann äh, musst du wissen. <lacht>